Hi guys, uh, welcome to this special dissertation series on thoughts. I'm Jonah and in this series we're going to be interviewing dissertation students. Uh, so about their dissertation topic specifically and also just more broadly about any advice that they might have for people who are writing the dissertations at the moment, uh, how they found the process of choosing their topic, how writing it was, kind of all that sort of stuff. Uh, in this episode, Jasmine and Alex will be interviewing Adam, who is a master's dissertation student, uh, and he's got a really interesting dissertation topic on cognitive enhancement. Uh, so if you enjoy the episode, uh, give, it, give it a thumbs up and subscribe, that would really help us out. Um, and yeah, we hope you enjoy. Today we'll be interviewing Adam about his master's dissertation. Uh, so yeah, let's just dive right in. Adam, introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your, your dissertation. Hello, um, I'm Adam. I write transcripts for thoughts, um, but when I'm not doing that, I'm preparing to be a PhD student this September at Glasgow doing cognitive enhancement and creativity. That's my area. And uh, cognitive enhancement was also the area of my master's dissertation. So Adam, tell us a bit more about what was your dissertation? What, what I mean, you said some words about the topic of just, your master's and it's the usual I'm sure they topic. mean something, but yeah, it's not very clear. It's the read. <laughs> The wee sort of advertising line you have for when relatives or friends ask you what you're doing, so you can sort of go, it's cognitive enhancement, and they go, oh, okay, good. Uh, the title of my master's dissertation was The Smart Choice Cognitive Enhancement and Wellbeing, so it's slightly different. It was about um, what potential effects different types of cognitive enhancements would have on your wellbeing and how to go about choosing between different types. Uh, probably the thing to say up front would be what cognitive enhancement is. Good question, me. Um, <laughs> uh, it's our job very easy. <laughs> Elon Musk keeps talking about his Neuralink brain implant. The little chip which yep. goes in the brain. That would be a, an example of a cognitive enhancement. I think that's probably more clear cut. People would go, oh yeah, I understand that as a cognitive enhancement. It's a piece of technology. It's not natural necessarily that's been inserted into me to make my brain function in a different way. Um, with regards to this topic in the way that I'm trying to describe it and be quite general, that sort of relates to why I came up with the topic of my dissertation. It sort of naturally arises from taking the course. Emma Gordon, who did the dissertation episode, runs. Um, well, she ran a course, she's run it this year as well, on this topic. And when you read the big papers in this topic, it always really, really, really irritated me how vague they could be about what constituted an enhancement. And they would discuss things as if they were very similar. Um, so for instance, was it imprecision or was it because of it was so abstract? Hard to say, sometimes a bit one, sometimes a bit another. Uh, easiest way to kind of think about it, and I think it's probably why it arises. This topic has arisen from imagining what might be the case in the future, whereas mm -hmm. at the moment it's things like if you take study drugs, are you cheating in exams? You know, because okay. um, you're enhancing your cognition, but that's not necessarily you. Things like that. What What is your opinion? Of that? Do you Oof. think you're cheating? Oof. Um, I, I think that's an analogous case to performance enhancing drugs in sport. So if there's a prohibition against that, then it's basically the rules of the game, as it were. Um, uh, but it's a big, it's a big, big, big mess, big Gordian's knot that I'm just going to hack in half at the moment and say yes. Um, things like that when they're talking about them, they would often discuss in the same breath study drugs and like neural link brain chip implants. It seems obvious to me that there's a big difference between popping a pill that makes you focus a bit more and having the, an interface to the internet inside your head. So 
because I was reading papers and wasn't necessarily feeling like anyone was quite dividing these things and trying to figure out what the differences is, that gave rise to the, to the topic. While you were speaking, I was thinking about how maybe my phone is some sort of cognitive enhancement. Yeah, there's, there is a, a wee bit of chatter about that, about quite where you draw the line, what distinguishes it. Right. I mean, interestingly, I considered in my dissertation um, nutrition and education as cognitive. I'm sorry, could you first yeah. repeat that and second explain that? <laughs> so the reason, my, my reasoning for thinking of this was if you take a person and you have them develop to full physical maturity, sure. they would have certain innate capacities and abilities, cognitively speaking. However, if you fed them, let's call that person control, very, you know, basically, this is just a, just a human being that you've given bare bones necessity to, to get them to the age of 18. Let's go for that. Now, if we cloned that human, this actually isn't in the dissertation, which is a slightly different way of putting in the dissertation, but it's probably the clearest way to do it. You've got your basic 18 year old. We're now cloning them. Let's bring them to full maturity at 18, but we're going to give them a very nutritional diet. Cognitively, they will be much more capable. Uh, just their brain will develop in a fashion that will allow them to perform better. The question is whether that degree of performance improvement constitutes enhancement. Um, I think if it's strong enough, yes. And then if you've got clone three, whom you, you educate for the 18 years, also when they get to 18, they'll be able to perform much better. Uh, cognitively, they'll be much more. So are they enhanced? It seems like, yes, they are. Even if you might think, oh, nutrition and education are very basic things, they're not biotechnology that, that are sophisticated. And that's how I came up with my, my two distinctions. One's practicality, one's technological sophistication. In terms of, sort of psychedelics and things like that that would fit in and how you distinguish them. When it comes to developing, well, actually, in terms of psychedelics, we can, we can use one of them in the technological sophistication distinction. LSD, the magic mushrooms. It's incredibly simple to grow magic mushrooms. They're mushrooms, they grow. That's the thing, they naturally occur. You find them in the forests. LSD, on the other hand, you have to have a chemist actually synthesize that. It, it, it's, it's a fairly complicated process. So you could already distinguish two things that you'd have in the same category of hallucinogenics into a simple one, uh, or actually a rudimentary one, technologically rudimentary and technologically sophisticated. And um, that sort of helps you begin if you were considering it from a sort of moral point of view, I suppose, and you're looking for practical advice on how do we decide in this case which one to use. So say you had a case where someone has clinical depression um, and they know that hallucinogenics in small doses help alleviate those symptoms. Which one would you use? Would you use the mushrooms or would you use the LSD? Well, there's lots of factors, including some that I didn't consider in my dissertation, but one of them, certainly of, of relevance, is how sophisticated is this thing to make? Uh, and if it's far more sophisticated, the technology and the requirements that you have to make LSD, but it's fairly simple to come up with mushrooms and they perform roughly the same task, seems that you've got a good reason for choosing mushrooms over LSD for that particular patient. And the other distinction was practicality. And now we are going to quote direct from the dissertation. Um, you've got two islands. We've got Robinson Crusoe one on one island, and we've got Robinson Crusoe two on the other island. Yeah. Parents of Robinson Crusoe's were not particularly imaginative when they came up with these two children. Um, Robinson Crusoe won. If you ever read the book, Robinson Crusoe is <laughs> ash, uh, uh, island living. He arrives, he's terrible at everything. But he kind of goes about it the right way. He tries to find shelter, he then tries to find water, he tries to find food. There you go. 
Robinson Crusoe 2, however, when he was in London, heard of this magnificent new drug called Hithlacite, which makes you almost infinitely more intelligent. So he decides, I'm going to try and synthesize some Hithlacite for a start, because it'll make me better. Everything will just make me far more efficient in my decisions. My decision making will be astounding. Uh, and I'll be able to remember things that I've forgotten about the environment, different things like that. Just his cognitive ability will be vastly improved compared to, to normal. I think intuitively, you would think that Robinson Crusoe 2 has went wrong. Like he's focusing on the wrong things. He's, he's right. If he makes this drug, it will definitely make him better uh, making decisions, building shelter, farming, all the tasks that he needs his brain for, he will be much better at. But there just seems to be intuitively something daft about it when the other Robinson Crusoe is, is just setting about finding water, shelter, and food. I, I think, think the irony there would be that the second guy would make the drug and then eat it and become like this very intelligent being and then realize that he's going to die in an hour because he hasn't drunk um, water or something and then be in full knowledge of why he's he's going to die in an hour because of his own stupidity. When, when I submit the paper to the Sundance Film Festival to turn into a short film, that is how it will end. <laughs> uh, but I think that the intuitive case is that Robinson Crusoe 2 isn't being very practical. Right. But then how does that come to be used for Hithlacite itself? Well, if it's very complicated to create or give to someone to treat them with it, then it's complex. But if it's just a wee pill and you've already got it, or it's a wee mushroom, it's very simple, pop in your mouth with that. So if you consider actual sort of cognitive enhancements we have these days, if you've got a case where you're trying to decide what would be there for the well-being of this patient, um, one of the considerations that you could make would be how simple versus how complex is it going to be to actually practically put this into place. If it's neurosurgery, I think we can all agree that neurosurgery is fairly complex, uh, whereas it's fairly simple, take a pill. So that's what part of the, the, the distinctions were. So in the dissertation, there was only two. It was practicality, how simple versus how complex is it to cognitively enhance this person, and technological sophistication, how, how rudimentary versus how sophisticated is the actual enhancement itself. It sounds like you've been really methodical with the way you approached your uh, dissertation, your master's dissertation, but you didn't do a philosophy undergrad, did you? Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the like going into um, a philosophy masters as someone who'd not studied it academically before um, for people who are embarking on a master's dissertation who like you hadn't studied it. I, I initially had applied to do um, English and philosophy at Edinburgh and English and literature and film and TV at Glasgow. I just wouldn't have been able to have actually afforded to live in Edinburgh. Yeah, as undergrad. I wouldn't be able to afford living in Edinburgh, I don't think so. I went for film. I also just really liked film and English. So I did four years, English Lit, Film and TV. No philosophy class. All my electives were history of art and English language, which you have to take. So you'll note, again, nay philosophy. And then when I was looking at courses, I'd always been interested, but never quite so done it. So uh, I, I, I came to do the conversion course at Glasgow. Um, I don't know, it's a difficult question to answer insofar as I imagine it and lots of it will come down to temperament. How do you approach it? Um, I, I think if, if you've decided to change to philosophy at that late stage, there's definitely been enough of an interest in it to make a fairly big decision. Um, so you, one would like to hope that you'd be engaged. Um, that, that being said, I suppose, it would be the, the same advice even to someone who, who wasn't doing that if, if they did philosophy and they're moving on to the masters. Just following that initial interest that you have in a very small topic in something, uh, identifying a particular area of philosophy that you like and in a very particular area within that area. 
I, I, I considered that perhaps, even though initially I was interested in art, I might be better off being pragmatic about it, which is probably the best advice you have. Even if you have this massive desire to create a brand new philosophical system, you think you can do it 15,000 words, just don't. <laughs> be pragmatic. <laughs> You've paid to do the degree, make sure you get it. Let's just focus, do something you can manage. And something you can manage is concrete idea. You've got some notion of work that you can do. I think the difference between undergrad and masters is in masters, you do have a bit more scope to be more ambitious, but at the same time, don't go completely mad with it. Ultimately, I felt that first and foremost, the most irritating aspect of doing work in the area was just this feeling that you might not be being very precise with your terms. So I thought, okay, that is a very concrete task. You can quite clearly begin the dissertation with, here's how they use these terms, here's how they discuss common transport just now, and here's some progress. Here are ways to go about it that might be a wee bit more practical, make a case for it. And also, <laughs> so, like with cognitive enhancement, you're not getting any emotional enhancement either. Like... This is part of my PhD. So we're gonna, well, you've hit the nail on the head. Well, the flaw of the discussion is focusing specifically on intelligence, as if intelligence is the only aspect of cognitive enhancement that's affected. Um, it, it, you can somewhat see why that is the case, because they're interested in brain implants, which seem to be affecting how intelligent you are, and for focus drugs and study drugs, things like that. However, I cannot see in a legitimate way why you ignore the emotional side of things. Mm -hmm. So I would consider mood enhancements to be or mood drugs to be uh, emotional enhancements as well mm. um but that's not in the dissertation all right i, I want to ask now how was how was the experience of masters um did you enjoy it was it yeah I yeah mean, yeah i mean i enjoyed it enough to you know <laughs> to go on three and a half year um did you enjoy it enough or are you just crazy enough well you know look at the hair make it on the city um I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, it was, of course, slightly curtailed by the combination of strikes and COVID, uh, which, you know, makes for, however, it should be said, that everything sort of locked down when dissertation was happening, so it probably couldn't happen that better time because you had nothing else to do but sit in the house and, and think yeah, and kind of get that going. I, I think at Masters, you're particularly encouraged to, to engage with, your tutors and, and things like that so if at undergrad you feel a wee bit conscious about emailing and you know any particular lecture first and foremost you shouldn't that is their job that's why they're there but secondly when you when you come to masters it just feels you feel like you're uh you know that you're you're closer as it were you the everything feels a wee bit more this is my case sort of open to you and and, and likewise it's good at Masters that you have the entire third term over summer to focus on your dissertation. Uh, I, I really enjoyed Masters, despite it being curtailed slightly. It was enjoyable, it was good. I would I recommend it, big recommend. <laughs> Thumbs up. I really want to ask if there's anything you wish you'd known before embarking on your uh, Masters disc. Is there anything you wish someone had like said taking you to the side and said look Adam this is golden wisdom take it to heart at the very beginning of the masters I assumed okay they've got this course on the history of philosophy things like that different things like this I think the history of philosophy is very interesting and very important however if there's courses there that are on contemporary subjects like contemporary topics prioritize them and do them so I was enlisted on one of the things like history of like modern philosophy or something like that. If you're looking to go to PhD, it's not necessarily going to be as useful to you as becoming abreast of the contemporary topics. So I swapped to contemporary ethics. Thankfully, that was the cognitive enhancement course, and it started a week later than the other ones. So I didn't miss anything. However, it would be good to know that up front. Now, you've got all the time in the world to read a history book, to read... Um, you know, the classics, texts, it's far more difficult to access the contemporary material and to keep abreast of it. If you want to read Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, it's a classic, you can do it. 
you, you, well, a course may be helpful, you can access quite easily lots of secondary material in that and the main text itself. Whereas something, for instance, uh, let's go Virtues of the Mind by Linda Zegzespi, I think it's Zegzespi, it's hard to say. Contemporary big work in epistemology. It's an expensive book, that's difficult to access. When you're at uni, you can access it at the library, you can do a course that might include material in it, things like that. It's, that's more pertinent. So prioritise the contemporary stuff. That's what I would say. So if you need something to know beforehand. The history of philosophy is very important, but you have all the time in the world to, to kind of look at that, focus on the, what's hot right now. What was your conclusion? Like, what, what was the <laughs> point you wanted to, to really pass with your dissertation? So there was three sections. Um, the first one was just cleaning up some concepts in cognitive enhancement and some underlying epistemological problems with it. Um, sure. Lots of that was on previous existing literature and then I added in my distinctions and things like that. And I also distinguished between cognitive ability and cognitive capacity, um, which is totally different. And to be honest, it was a wee bit loose in the paper, but um, it helped. It, it was another piece of like, here's what the literature says, here's my wee idea turning into it. It was then a bit on well-being, which was mostly, I found the theory of well-being. I'm going to critique it, make a wee addition to it, but that was really just expositional work. The third section was the important bit with the conclusions. That was, we're focused on well-being. We have cognitive enhancement now. We can identify things. Let's invent some sophisticated interventions. And we've got these rudimentary ones. So we had good diet and education, which technologically are quite rudimentary. We've been teaching people and feeding them well in some places for thousands of years. Yeah. Um, whereas Hithlocyte, my fantastic made up drug, um, which, which <clears throat> is a really weird wee pun that I stole from Thomas More. Because I think Hithlos in ancient Greek means nonsense and ate means peace, so it's piece of nonsense. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I'm spelling it in the chat because I, I still haven't understood what the word is. <laughs> uh, um, and I also came up with a fake cognitive implant uh, called Cogito. So I said, both of these things improve your IQ by 30 points. I mean, this could be like an ad for you to get recruited by Elon Musk to, <laughs> to name his products. The idea was you've got a simple but sophisticated intervention, that's the pill, very simple to take, but sophisticated to make. Um, and you've got a complex, but sophisticated one, the brain implant. You've also got a simple, but rudimentary one, which is the diet, it's very simple to eat. And you've got a slightly more complex, but rudimentary enhancement in education. Education is a long process and it is complicated, but at the end of the day, you don't need a huge amount of technology to do it. In terms of well-being, which would be best? So, I mean, I quite like this about philosophy, but this is what annoys some people. It is essentially 15,000 words with some quite complicated arguments to come to the conclusion that if you want to be both happier and smarter, have a salad and go to school. Um, you know, <laughs> that's, instead of popping the drugs and getting an implant. Part of it being that I... That's the title of the episode. Yeah, I, I feel with the, with the brain implants, one of my arguments, which is probably a wee bit iffy, but I think it still in principle works. If I put a neural implant into you and you woke up, if you didn't have any training on how to use this new thing that's in your head, I don't think it would work properly. So you, you, you would maybe be able to use it in a wee way and it may help boost and things like that, but if you really wanted to get the most out of your implant, you probably need to be trained or given an you know, introduction to it and sort of coached through it. I guess that's a very similar argument to if you want to communicate with somebody, it's not enough to just make sounds. You need to speak in a language. But I think the way that that undercut taking you know, the implant versus having an education is that it's now looking like you need to have at least a very basic amount of education in order to even use the implant. So yeah. why would you prioritize the implant over the education when that works? And the very basic thing that in terms of well-being, having a good diet and, and 
and having some form of education has confers multiple benefits. You know, never drop an idea, always keep them. I have hundreds of these. They're, they're from Poundland. They're just basic black lined notepads with dates in them. I write the dates. Keep ideas, <laughs> keep notepads. I've actually got a fresh new one, which only has oh. one page ready for my diff. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that's in it so far. It's it's going to be killed at the end of this year, at the end of next year. Well, there's so, a few ways to go about it. So I, I, I've did a couple, I've experimented, and I found the one that works for me. This is also good. I think in master's year, you can kind of panic yourself about how much you have. But if you really just look at your deadlines, which is the important bit, you've got a lot of time. You know, try, try and just sort of frame it like that. You've got an awful lot of time. Um, in that master's disc, there was broadly two big topics. There was well-being and there was cognitive enhancement. There was clearly one was more of a focus than the other, but it could be useful to keep two of these, keep one in well-being, keep one in cognitive enhancement. If you have notes, you keep them separate. Or if, it's, if you prefer being more blended than that, just have a particular notebook for your dissertation. Keep notes in it, keep writing things. But you know, don't necessarily throw them away. You might find that they're useful. It's kind of useful to go back and look at what you were thinking. You can, it's quite clarified. You go, God, that's wrong. Staggeringly wrong. Um, the, the, the problem I have with this is that my handwriting is very oh, bad. Likewise, <laughs> it's like um, from afar, it looks a bit like a sort of 17th century scroll. It looks like Elvish. You know, vague, vaguely, aesthetically pleasing, but fundamentally useless. <laughs> as a method of information story. I do want to ask um, how you came up with the actual wording of the question for your dissertation, because I think that sounds like one of the hardest things when you've got so many different trains of thoughts going on and how to um, come up with just a single sentence which you're going to focus on. Um, work with your tutor, your advisor. Um, I had a very broad idea that I wanted to work in these areas um, and I asked Emma for some ideas. She then gave me some ideas, it refined a wee bit more and then came back to her. She gave us more ideas, it refined it a wee bit more. That's one way to do it. Work with your tutor, they will guide you correctly. They're not gonna advise you to do something you know, that's terribly wrong or, or off the track. They know what they're doing. If I was doing it now, and I think I, I did sort of find a way to do it by having done it and gone through that process. It comes back to the requirements of what you've been asked to do in a dissertation. You know, you've got to make a bit of a contribution, just a, 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 something you can do. The more concrete that is, the clearer it will be and the, and the less nervous you'll feel about it. I think most of the nerves that people have about a dissertation come from the fact that they have lots of ideas, but they're all a bit woolly. They don't quite know how they're going to put down an answer. Well, if you're doing something in a course and there's a particular thing that sticks, that you just get caught on, that's probably a good idea to follow. And it's a very useful phrase to remember is, this is out with the scope of this dissertation. If you come across a topic that you kind of need to include a bit, but you don't have time to go into it, that's fine. You're not writing about everything all at once. I think we're probably going to have to wrap it up here because we we could talk for hours and hours, which I said for Ariana's one as well, but it's just the way it is, isn't it? Um, but thank you so much, Adam, for talking to us about your master's dissertation. It's no, I know. As I said earlier on, you know, once I've finished PhD, come back, talk about it, I've got an answer. Yeah. Schedule one in three and a half years. <laughs> it's already on the, on the calendar. <laughs> on the calendar. Yep. I'll have a new cardigan by then. <laughs>